Axons Unleashed. G'day everyone, my name's Robbie Turner. Welcome to another episode of Axons Unleashed. Now, mark this day down in your calendar. It's a watershed moment because I've got a new host next to me, the man who was on the other side of the of the microphone just last week, the one, the only, the man himself, the myth, the legend, coming live and un- uninterrupted from downtown Gold Coast, Lukey Millwood. Hey, yeah, RT, mate. Great to be on this side of the camera. Uh, great to be on this side of the microphone. The shackles are off. Lucky it's so- not one of these ones. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, everyone's like, Luke Millwood. Who the fuck is <laughs> Who that? The fuck's that bloke? <laughs> Good great, to see you there, mate. Great to be on this side, mates, and uh, really looking forward to you know the, what we've what we've got to offer over the next sort of you know the next time period. Ten years. The next ten years. <laughs> what we've got to offer though, in in terms of this year and, and what we're going to bring to the you know bring to our clients and bring to the to the world mm. um, with Axons Unleashed uh, and and you know getting to know some of the challenges and and some of the you know the highlights of people going through through basic training. You know, it's it's one of those watershed you know moments in people's careers and their lives that they often look back on and never forget never forget. impactful very impactful you meet very very um grumpy ds's along the way <laughs> and you and you form and and you form those bonds and those friendships with people that last a lifetime and so you know that's a u- very unique experience that comes with being in the adf so i'm really looking forward to giving that giving other people the opportunity to be able to share those experiences yeah. too what i love about having you here is that i'm in my 10th year of being out so come August this year, 2023, that's my 10-year anniversary, you're in your like 10-month of being out. Yeah. So you've got much more contemporary experience. So I know you're actually going to relate to some of our guests in the here and now or over a longer term much, much more than I. I'm just an old bastard that's just <laughs> been around long enough that I can jaw off and not give a fuck what people think. I'm still like a baby emperor <laughs> penguin, mate. I've still got the fluff on me. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> <clears throat> I know how to fluff as well, but anyway, that's a that's a, maybe we'll do another another podcast for that one. But our guest here today, ladies and gentlemen, it, it is the Robbie and Luke show. But we've we actually we've actually got a guest here with us. For those not watching on YouTube, you're like, fuck, is there someone else's hand I can see? Yes, there is. Um, we've got a new coaching axe on as well. We do. This guy is a fucking rock star. He brings balance to the chaos that is Robbie and Luke. He said to us when we first started, he's like, hey, I've been following you guys for a while, and I've loved being a, a client. I'm now putting words in your mouth, Robbie. He's like. I'm not like you. I'm like, you don't fucking have to be. We don't need yes. to. <laughs> but Ryan Lewis, welcome to Axons Unleashed, brother. How are you feeling? Good, I'd say. Yeah, happy to be here. Pumped. Good man. All right. Um, so as we know, this is all about basic training, but effectively I want to use this podcast as a bit of an intro mm. of you to the world. Sure. Uh, you've got a very un- unique experience. So as a bit of a bottom line up front, uh, Ryan's an ex-Air Force Intello, um, but you didn't join straight out of school. So I'm really interested to know your story and, your, you know, it's almost like when I went to when I was at Kapuka um, teaching recruits and then at Duntroon teaching bloody buffets like you, I used to love as an instructor. I loved finding someone who wasn't there straight out of school, yeah. someone who had a bit of life experience and someone who had that depth and context of what it's like to be an adult. As because as you know, I joined straight out of school. I was like, mm. I used to like you know go and bail them up and like right fuck face tell us what's going on with these other little shits that are straight out of school i'm now using you as my mole i want you to tell me what's the vibe is of like you know what the what the training group is so i'm keen to know on whether you had as a bit more of a mature age recruit and or cadet um going through your office of training school you know what your relationship was like with your instructors etc etc and then we'll sort of finish off i'm like what what are you doing now like why do you have an axon shirt on how did that occur yeah still not sure we'll yeah. see <laughs> Well, you are still on, on probation, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan Lewis, mate, um, who are you? Where did you grow up? Tell us uh, what, what your upbringing was like and what did you do straight from school? Yeah, thanks, RT. Um, so, yeah, born and bred in Penrith, so in the main streets of Western Sydney. The Riff. Yeah, the Riff. <laughs> they call it God's country. Oh, no, the people from Penrith call it God's country. No one else calls it God's country. <laughs> Everyone else has a name for it. It's not God's country. <laughs> I'm um, loving this already. Yeah, so born, born there. My parents were Western Sydney through and through, but thankfully they saw the light and I was about six or seven and they went, fuck this, we're getting out of here. And they went as far as they could away within, um, within New South Wales. So we ended up at Tweed Heads, like 20 minutes down the road. That is so as far north on New South Wales as you can go. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So And a beautiful place to, to, to it go is to a high nice school. Place. Um, turned me into a surfer, which, which is awesome. Good. Um, so yeah, did school down there. Um, tried to join the military out of year 12. So, where did that inspiration come from? 
So my dad was a major in the cadets. Stand fast. Oh, in the cadets? Yeah, cadets. Not yep. even a yep. real major? No, not a real major. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> I tell him that all the time. <laughs> Neither was I, mate. Don't worry. <laughs> Is this uh, your dad that I met down on the, the swing set yeah, the other mate, week? Yeah, mate. Hive is wearing non tradie Mate, he yep. spoke so – he was <laughs> – what not was – is you're so proud to be your dad. Yeah, yeah, Telling yeah. me how good you were at sport and how good – like just amazing you were as a son and how much of a great job he did raising you, etc. Sorry you had to go through that. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to save you a couple of times. But I got Hello, Dad, that if, you're, if you're listening, by the way. I did love your high vis shirt, even though there was not a fucking plumber in sight <laughs> a pl- a, a, and a, uh, a requirement for any tradies to be there, but you were still there in your high vis. Go ahead. Safety first. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he, he ended up being, well, he was a school teacher. Um, so I ended up going to school where he was a teacher. Um, and then, yeah, so as I said, out of year 12, wanted to join the ADF. So dad was a, a major in the, the cadets. And on my mum's side, her dad was in the Air Force back in the, you know, yeah, 40s, 50s, something, which I actually right. didn't know at that point. Mm. I didn't know until many years later. Never, never spoke about it. Um, mm. Same as my two grandparents. They never, they never, they wouldn't. They weren't pulling me aside as an eight-year-old and going, now let me fucking tell you about what it was like to be in the Second World War. Yeah. Like, I just yeah. I just didn't have any any awareness. Yeah, so queen, completely coincidental that I ended up in, in the Air Force from that standpoint. Um, but, yeah, so year 12, because I grew up surfing and lived in Tweed Heads, I was aiming for Navy. I was like, fuck, go into the bush. I don't want to do that. Nope. Didn't know much about the Air Force. So Navy was it. Wanted to just be on a ship, and I knew I'd be posted um, around, like, coastal areas of... Of Australia. Um, yeah, so I wanted to join the Navy. Um, what unfortunately happened was I went far too along the the recruitment process. So I had childhood asthma. Basically, oh, right. the medical team missed it. So I was green lit. I was off to the Navy. I was telling people I was going. And then I got a phone call one day that said, sorry, mate, we, uh, we missed this on your form. Um, you're out. Because back then it was... And did it impact you a lot? Did you feel like it did? Like yeah, you walk yeah, around with a puffer and stuff all the time? Uh, oh, no, no. It was, no. It was just childhood. So oh, right. I, was, I, was I didn't realise there was a different source. Yeah, yeah. So I grew out of it, essentially. Um, but back then it was a zero tolerance uh, for, for people with childhood. What year are we talking about? Situate us there. 2002. Okay. Three. Right, and mate. How did you how did you feel about that sort of curveball being thrown at you? Like you were going through the recruiting process, obviously, mm. and you sort yeah. of had your heart set on yep. on joining the pass. Um, what was what was sort of the curveball, and how did you feel? Take us through that. That, that rocked me. Yeah. Um, as a shit, 17, 18 year old. Yep. Told family, told friends, saw my kind of career path, and thought this is going to be amazing. Mm. Complete curveball. Said you're not you're not ever essentially going to be in. Can you remember what the actual – let's talk about that for a second. I love mm. finding out these little things and going deep. So yeah. take me back, take our listeners back into like you've got off the phone from old mate at recruiting and yeah. literally, can you remember how that made you feel? Oh, it was, it was shocking. I was, I was crying. Yeah. yeah. Fair I was enough. a 17-year-old, um, you know, fresh out of high school, hadn't quite turned 18 yet. Um, yeah, I was crying to mum because that's all I wanted to do um, at that point. What was her reaction? Yeah, can you, I mean, can you remember? standard yeah. motherly stuff. I was like, it's going to be all right. It's going to be you know, okay. Yeah. You're young. We'll find something else. So put me through the ringer um, as, a, as a 17, 18-year-old. And you've got such a great beard, mate. So you <laughs> would have been totally suited to being in the Navy. That's maybe why I, I gravitated towards <laughs> it, I think. <laughs> um, uh, just quick, have you had a chance to reflect on that over the years? Do you feel as if those challenging times in our teenage years can come back to benefit us down the track? Or was it just a little speed bump? You're like, fuck it, whatever, and just moved on. It took me a while to get over it, and I think there was benefit in it, particularly going through the recruiting process again later on in life um, because that, that issue came up again, but there was under different circumstances, and I think the resilience I got from it definitely Good. benefited me. That's what I was um, inquiring mm, about, yeah. yeah. It, it took took a while. As a, All as right, a, so a yeah. little bit like you, Luke, when we're done true, what do you do now, platoon commander? Yeah. So what does what is 18-year-old Ryan do with his life now? Well, first things first, I went out, I was on the Gold Coast, so I went out to the nightclubs and got absolutely plastered. <laughs> Fuck, good answer. <laughs> um, sat around for a bit, had absolutely no idea. Um, I'd had some other university offers to do visual arts, I was a bit of an arty person in school. But wasn't really feeling it. Didn't really know where that was going to take. Oh, me. your dad was telling me you're an excellent drawer. Yeah, true story. Allegedly, yeah. right? Yeah, mate. I want, look, I want to buddy get you on on the whiteboard, and I'll be like, right. Question without warning. Draw me a something. 
and I want to see you do it. I can draw you a horse. I was going to say, what's your forte, mate? I didn't say a horse. (laughs) But anyway. (laughs) Yeah, what's the stick figure? What's your forte? What do you you enjoy drawing and, you know, what's what's all this? I'm a shit drawer, so I'm actually (laughs) fascinated by people that can draw really well. I can't even draw a conclusion, mate, so. (laughs) (laughs) I'm okay at them, but not these ones. (laughs) I haven't drawn since probably not long after high school. Um, So... But in high school, I was doing a lot of portrait stuff and a lot of anim, which is that kind of Japanese cartoony yep. stuff. Right. I did a visual art project back in year 12 that ended up in the the um, art touring um, gallery stuff that they do for year 12 students. So it was it was quite well received. It's got the red dot or whatever they call it, which which leapfrogged me into some visual arts degrees in uni. Did you know you had a talent? No. Like, oh, I, just I just enjoyed it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, just enjoyed it. I, drew any, I used to draw anything. Like I'd draw... I used to collect like surfers magazines. I draw surfers. Right. I draw bodyboarders. Yeah. I draw cricketers. I just draw anything. Yeah, yeah. very clever, but mate. But haven't touched it since, what are we saying, 2003 probably. Okay, yeah. so a little while. Yeah, yeah. So if you ask me to draw something, you get a stick figure. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. I'm sure I'm sure it's still going to be bloody great. All right, so when did, because I know you actually had a really great career before you joined the military. Yes. So just take us into that. Yeah, cool. So it took me a little while to get to that too. So straight after, a bit of a bit of a hot mess. Um, got my bartending certificate and just did the the bartending stuff on the Gold Coast for a couple of years. Um, I'm thinking Tom Cruise spinning bottles, fucking just it. doing what. Yeah, 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 yeah. great. Yeah. Good. Cocktails Were you Tom dreams. Cruise or Brian Brown? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Brian Brown. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then, yeah, I turned 21. Still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, so I I bought a ticket and went to London. I lived in the UK for the better part of two years. Awesome. Yeah, so that was that was awesome. I went over essentially on my own, but I had some mates over there already. That would have been shit, um, strapping, fit, good-looking bloke over in the UK in the early twenties, behaving yourself. Did all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was the what was the co- the you know the mindset behind going to the UK? Was it just kind of like a gap year, you know, per se, or was it? You had some other intent behind it, or was it just kind of I want an experience in life? Zero intent. Yep. It was literally just I'm pouring beers here. I can go pour beers in London, checks out, and I can see a bit of Europe while I'm doing it. Yeah, checks um, out. Sen- effectively, when I got got over there, I didn't even pour a beer. I, a, a bloke picked me up and said, "You want to do some concreting?" So I yeah. turned into a, a concreter for two years in in London. You were still pouring. Still pouring, just couldn't drink it. <laughs> <laughs> bit hard to drink, yeah. That's what we say, Luke. When when someone needs a bit of harden up, go and fucking drink it. Go and drink a, a glass of concrete. You'll be fine. <laughs> there you go. What was the highlight of being over there? Um, this is a PG show, as you know, so keep it that way, please. But yeah, what was a as you as you reflect on your time over there as a bloke in your in your early twenties? Because plenty of people have, will, whatever else, mm. go and sort of explore the world as well. What did you? What's one of your key takeaways? Uh, go to as many countries as you can. Mm, why? Essentially, don't say no to anything. I said no to a lot of trips, even though I saw a lot. And that's one thing that I look back on my time in the UK and thought, shit, I should have just went. And, you know, I did a bunch, but there's a bunch that I said no to. Um, you know, obviously, there's factors contributing to that, whether you can afford it. You know, I was living in a share house of nine people in a two better. Woo! So oh, it was geez. cramped. <laughs> Holy mate. shit. You would have farted in your ears, <laughs> Pop, mate. That's a lot of people. Nine <laughs> people in a two better. Yeah, we had. Two in each bedroom, and we had the rest in the living room. That would have been like being in the Navy. Yeah. There's some pretty right. confined yeah. living quarters in the Navy, let me tell you. <laughs> You're like, fuck it, if I can't do it, I'll go replicate it yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> what was the highlight, mate? Oh, two years um, is a long period. I know yeah. you would have had some ups and downs while you were over there. Two, yeah, lots of ups and downs. Two highlights. One, the fact that I just did it. Yeah. Um, and that I managed to fall into a job that allowed me to work all over London. So... You pour a concrete slab, it's done. You don't come back to that work yeah. site. So I worked on Arsenal Football Stadium. I worked in Chelsea. I worked on the Thames. I saw an insane um, amount of London and getting getting paid getting to paid. do it. So good. The second bit was um, my favourite country, which was Spain. Just loved it. Wish I'd have probably spent more time there. Um, but What Barcelona, about Spain do you like? I think it was the... Well, it's similar to the Gold Coast, mm-hmm. but um, the people and... We'll get to this point is how I ended up in town planning, but the architecture right. of the country really, really kind of. I loved walking the streets and looking at all the buildings. Barcelona is a very special city, isn't mm. it? You've been there, Luke? I haven't, mate. Right. I haven't. Mm. I'm still uncultured. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> You've been plenty of other places, <laughs> though. You are very also. cultured for the record. <laughs> all right, that's good. So, um, what was the spark to bring you back to Australia? Yeah, so the you go over there on a on a two year visa. So your time's essentially up un- unless you've found something else. You get sponsored or you find someone to to marry or whatever, which was not where I was at at that point in my life. Fair enough. Um, too. 
So I was looking to come back to go back to university or go to university and I was tossing up between architecture and town planning. Remembering that I was a bit, bit arty-farty at school, I was looking at architecture um, but I was having a conversation with an architect in a pub in London and he convinced me not to do it essentially because uh, you go to university for a long time, it's six years I think, and you come out and, and the money's pretty poor for a while after that. Um, coincidentally, he, he mentioned town planning which is similar field um, you have a greater impact on on a city um, and it's a shorter degree and more money. And so when I was 20, 23 then, 24, I was like, sweet, I'll pick that one. When you say town planning, just mm. give me like the, what's the layman's terms um, definition or understanding of what does a town cool. planner do? I'm going to make you a town planner in two seconds. All Don't right. put a childcare centre. I'll do my best work in two <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Don't put a childcare centre next to a sewage treatment. That's pretty fucking simple. Yeah. Right, okay. You're all good. Literally just planning out major no. infrastructure projects to yeah, make so it a livable Exactly, community. a little bit facetious there. So there's different levels of town planning. You can be in things called development assessment where you're approving the stuff that's getting built in a city or you're in strategic planning where you're sitting down and writing 20, 30, 40 year plans for, say, Gold Coast, Newcastle where I lived, Sydney, and you just map everything out. Right, so you moved back to Newcastle. What's yeah, the go well, there? there's a bit um, of a story there too. Yeah, yes. so I came, came back to the Gold Coast, did my degree. At that point, it was, when I was finishing, was around the GFC, so 2008, I think. Um, the development on the Gold Coast was drying up. There wasn't a lot of stuff going on, which means there was no town planning jobs. I had a couple of mates living in Newcastle that said, mate, you will love this city, come down. So I finished the degree and went down there and started, started working in Newcastle. When, you, when mm. you were doing that, mate, did you still have that spark in your guts for defence? Like, was it still a case of there was still something unresolved in the back of your mind? Or was that kind of for you, you laid it to bed and you're like, right, that door's closed and now another one's open, I'm going to run down that path? On reflection, wasn't resolved. Yep. But if you'd asked me, then I was like, yeah, you know, sure. fuck the military, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm fuck on. those guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking childhood, um, fucking ass. Don't, don't deserve me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> but... Um, as I went along in my journey, there was definitely something unresolved in that space. Um, so, yeah, went down to Newcastle, ended up being a town planner for the better part of 10 years. Yeah, working both in uh, Newcastle City Council for the local government and then also on the other side of the table, so working for the private industry for development. So what years were those? Were we talking 2006 through uh, to 16, no, so like as a guess? 2000 and, uh, what are we, 2000, I moved down in 2011, right. actually, and then moved lived there up until last year essentially yeah okay. um but yeah so i finished my degree in 2008 2009 bummed around here for a bit and went down there yep. yeah newcastle was like there's been a lot of development in that greater newcastle region throughout that period yeah as people young. were working out that it's too fucking expensive to live in sydney yep. let's let's go one commutable distance away and just a much much better lifestyle but much more affordable yeah and i was very fortunate enough in being in the council through that growth period for Newcastle, that there was a lot of stuff going on. So when I moved down there, you go down the main street of Newcastle, there's roller shutters on everything. It's it's yeah. just a it was just a it shit was. show. Yeah. 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 Um, so we did a lot of work in the council, working with the developers to revitalise the the city. Thankfully, we had a, a Lord Mayor at the time that was very pro development. Um, so that gave a lot of um, positive reinforcement to the developers that had left Newcastle and went to Sydney to come back. Just get, getting out of that mindset. This yep. is not just a steel city. Exactly. This is a you know a, mm. a city which is vibrant. It's got so many different industries. It's, it's such a great lifestyle up there. It's right near. I mean, fuck. Even the V8 supercars. That's right. You yeah. know, their their yep. first race of the year, the flagship opening of the season, is occurring in another couple of weeks' time. Yeah. You don't get that shit if it's not a decent place to be. Yeah, I, I still think it's one of um, Australia's best kept secrets. To be honest. Yeah. Um, you've got the city. You've got the beaches, the surf, and then you have got the vineyards. You know, Nelson Bay, well. Big mm. Raft Base, etc., yep. etc. Et so that might be a little, you know, how how did um, did living near a Raft Base influence you there? Obviously, you can hear the jets flying over reasonably frequently, depending on which part of Newcastle you live in. No, so living didn't. Um, but while I was down there, I started to do um, CrossFit. So while how do you know when someone does CrossFit? <laughs> they're fucking, fucking telling you, yeah, everyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. I don't do it anymore. <laughs> 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 but it is kind of pivotal to the story, unfortunately, so I've got to mention it. Um, oh, I'll do CrossFit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and the gym I joined had a whole lot of uh, RAF people going there. And one of those persons persons was Amana, uh, which right. is 
Who's our mum? Yeah. Mate. Just give us a quick insight. She's, into that. she's now my wife. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Congratulations. Well yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. Got there. Um, so being around the RAF community, just in the gym space, was like, oh, yep, yeah, that's right. The military thing started to, you know, the feeling in your gut. I was a bit unresolved, like I said before. Yep. Were you, did, you, did you, let's go deeper on that, did you mm. see that there was some camaraderie and teamwork and just vibe and character about these individuals? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. as I got to know them in the gym setting, we'd go out and have a drink and then you'd start to meet more and you'd see that camaraderie and then also through through Amana's network, um, you start to. I started to get an inside look into the military and that's when I was like, yeah, this is, this is something that I still want to give a go. Um, so it took me a while to do it. Um, and I think it was, you know, my my nagging and stuff. Amanda just said, "Shut up and join." Yeah. No. Um, Had you guys become an item? So did yeah, you join so after you got together? This exactly tells, right. Yeah. So yeah, we met in almost almost as soon as I got to Newcastle. It wasn't far up, um, far after I got there. Amanda had a partner at the time, so we were just training at the same gym. Um, and then yeah, our kind of relationship started not long after. Her other one ended before, thankfully. You don't, you don't need to explain yourself here, mate. <laughs> Luke, Luke and I are like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's not ask him any questions. Yeah. I'm happy to be the grey man, but that's a grey area you don't want to be in. <laughs> Dangerous ground minefield. That's right. Um, so, yeah, we started dating for, for a while and I was still town planning. I was happy at that point, but there was something um, I was noticing. At that point in, in Amana's career, she was quite happy in what she was doing. Um, and it just kind of reignited that thought process of like, yeah, this is something I still want to do. Um, I hadn't decided at that point whether it was going to be which service. So I still knew it wasn't um, wasn't going to be army. I didn't like the bush. I don't camp. Digging so. holes yeah. fucking sucks. Nah. And so laying in the cold as well, mate, it's yeah. not that much fun, if you remember. So, the coldest night ever in Canberra, ever. I recall. Um, ever. Just quickly, side note, um, good mate of mine from 30 years ago um, that I played army footy with back in the early 90s, he came and dropped in the office the other day. He goes, oh, my son's just on his way. He's going to go to Duntroon. I'm like, oh, that's great. What does he want to do? He goes, he wants to go to infantry. He's an engineer. I'm like, you wait till he's out there digging fucking holes in yeah. Majura and we'll work out whether he wants to go to infantry or not. So <laughs> he's like, yeah, that's it. Especially when a little bobcat can come over and just dig that sucker in 30 seconds for you. I'm like, yeah, the infantry don't know how to drive bobcats. <laughs> so, yeah. It's a quick nav check, mate. If yeah, you yeah, digging yeah. holes in the fucking cold, I guess. Correct. <laughs> so that's good. I'm glad you had the realisation that, like, living out of tin food, putting on cam cream, sleeping under a hoochie and getting fucking rained on and or – you know, sweating your balls off every day is not the highest and best use of one's time. And no, you, and I did that for four days at OTS and that was enough for me. Oh, shit, yeah, I yeah, stand yeah, fast. Yeah, your yeah, skin's right. too good, mate. Your skin's <laughs> too yeah, good yeah. to put cam cream on that, I tell you. And I'm whilst worried, I wasn't I'm in worried. infantry, when you spend 11 years as a Special Forces officer, I know what it's like to go through all that stuff. So, yeah, <laughs> not for me anymore. But, so you joined, Air Force was your, your main go. Yeah, so essentially, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Amana and I were uh, essentially married at that point. So we, we got together in 2012, got married in 2016 um, and started to do the process um, of joining. I landed on the RAF purely f- because of the fact that Amana was in and I knew more about the RAF than I did the other services at that point. Still didn't really know what I wanted to do. So Amana helped me a lot putting me into contact with people. Um, so I spoke to pilots, spoke to air traffic controllers, spoke to logistics um, and ended up speaking to some Intellos as well. What a, what a great resource to have, mate, is someone that's inside the wire, so to speak, yep. to be able to give you a no-bullshit, no-bones sort of you know perspective. And, and if they don't have that experience, mm. they can certainly put you in touch with people that do. Cause, yeah, it's phenomenal. Because, you know, defence is, defense is one thing where you see it on the poster and you, you sort of jump in mounds in tanks. Um, but, you know, it's another thing to give you that real-life perspective of what it's going to be like once you go through that training. That, that's fantastic. Yeah, and, and the goods aren't always as advertised, right? So yeah. um, it was really good to speak to and pick apart each different role that I was sort of interested in at that point. Um, but, yeah, ended up going down the, the Intello role. Um, so uh, what was it like when you got accepted? Yeah, it was huge. In contrary like, to your other experience. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, um, it, was a, it was a lengthy process, as I mentioned earlier, it, and the resilience from the first time helped. Um, had to go through a whole bunch of, of asthma testing again because it was still on my file from the previous time. Of course. But thankfully, at that point, they changed the entry standards. So I think it was in 2008 or nine they did like a review of, of um, entry standards. I think they needed a bit of a recruitment drive and realised they were turning people away that might not Candidates. necessarily um, need to be. So how old, how old were you now? Yeah. So I was 33. Truth. Okay. Yeah. That's yep. not the oldest, mate. I, I had a, had a uh, private come in that was 43 
um, came into one of my platoons. But what it, it, as you know, as RT touched on before, mate, it gives you a life perspective mm. that you're bringing to the table. Mm. Yeah. So I actually commissioned on my birthday in 2019. Okay. So was, Amazing. Was, yeah. Which was, it was a big day. It was, it was really cool. So is that at the completion of officer training school. Sorry, no, that was like um, going down to eight, uh, DFR, signing the documents, and then you're off to. to right. East yeah, right. It was my birthday. Got it. Yeah, okay, away you go. Excellent. Let's talk about that. Mm. Let's talk about the uh, one of the one of the um, the questions that we normally have is like, can you speak of the most challenging aspects of basic training? And you're like, <laughs> bro, I went to. RAF officer training school. There's nothing challenging about it. That's not, <laughs> now, oh, now, it's now all I'm being facetious. So, you know, so, so, so please, mate, tell it? us what was it like when you first got down there. Like, just give us mm. your, give us your little spiel about the transition that you had to go from being a mature age civilian professional man into now transitioning into be a professional military officer. Yeah, and it was a lot of. That was a very consistent question that I was getting through the recruitment process. Um, certainly the recruiting officer and the psychologist were asking a lot of questions about how do you think you will go as a 33, 34-year-old mm. um, transitioning into defence generally when people are 17, 18. Yeah. Um, I didn't know at that point, right? I just said, I'll be sweet. I'll roll with it. It'll be all good. Um, moving down to, to East Sale, which is where OTS is, 17 weeks down there, um, I didn't really find the transition challenging, to be honest. Um, Did they shave your head, mate? No, mate. No, oh, no. There was caviar and lobster on arrival, mate. <laughs> 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 no, but this is interesting because I was just thinking then, a lot of people that are going to listen to this podcast are either serving members or, or veterans, yep. no dramas. But if anyone listening to this podcast right now has got a friend or a family member or someone who's lost direction in their life mm. that you can still join the military yeah, in absolutely. your early 30s. Yeah, yeah, so this, what you're about to pass on now in, in, in all seriousness is going to be very insightful mm. that if you've had a successful career and in, in, but you're just not feeling it and you yeah. want to go do something else, go and join the military. Like, oh, I'm a huge advocate for people to jo join the military. Yeah, that's right. So the, my ult the decision ultimately was I didn't want to be 60 and sit there on the couch and go, shit. Never gave it a crack. Life's full of regrets, yeah. mate. Yeah, yeah for so, sure. So pulled the trigger and, and joined at the ripe old age of 33, 34. Great. Um, so yeah, down in East Sale, it was, the first week was interesting. Um, so that's the, you know, the MSIs come in, they wake you up at 4, 5 a.m., drag you out of your room, sheets over your shoulders. Good. It was a bit of fun for me, to be honest. It's a bit of capture. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, You know, the, the, right, you're, you're ours now. Yeah, you fucking right. joined us. Yep. This is the rules of the road. Yeah. They're banging that's on rock your and doors. Roll. They're screaming at you. They're making you form up out the front of the building. Oh, good. Um, for me, though, Ultimately, I was a surfer. I was getting up at 3, 4 a.m. every day for years. So when they kind of banged on my door, I was sort of already awake. Already going, right, cool, to go. time to go. Just did, had to grab a bed sheet. Mm. Did, did you note no, you're a trainee going through? So there's mm. that, there is that separation between instructors and trainees at all levels, like yep. that level of professionalism. But did you notice that there was a stark or even a slight difference between the relationship that you had potentially with the, with the, the duty staff as opposed to, you know, some, you know, some young whippersnapper full of... Full of enthusiasm uh, coming in. Yeah, not not at the start, yeah. but certainly. So it was, as I said, seventeen week program. As you kind of get through the first phase, the relationships start to form with sure. your DS. Sure. And that's when I noticed there was me and a couple of others that were in our thirties, but they were retreads, right? So they yeah. were they were commissioning yeah. from the ranks. Mm. Um, I noticed some, a shift in the way that the language towards me, and then also um, I would often get people. So they'd move people around in their rooms. We were never kind of essentially in the same. Same room. That's some interesting. People, yeah. Some people yeah. weren't, yeah. There's a bit of a tactic, I think, to unsettle people. I didn't move rooms, but the person next to me was you a You had bit people of a room come into your room. room. Yep. And um, <clears throat> so I was I was with a gent next to me that was late 20s, and not long after that I had an 18-year-old next to me. That would have been different. It was very different, yeah. <laughs> you know, asking me how to, how to clean stuff. But um, I didn't find out until weeks later that they did that on purpose because of – my age and yep. life life experiences at yeah. that point. Yeah, that, good. That this guy needed a bit of provide a sounding yeah. board. I'd imagine yeah. for, for someone who may be in a, you know you know mm. RT talks about going in and the shock and awe of you know crying and, and wanting your mum. Mm. Um, and you know there's no there's it, it is a it's a life changing experience to say the least to go in there. It's so, supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. Yes, to, to reset yeah. you, reset who you are as a person, and inculcate mm. you into the culture. But you know to have that would have been a great resource for that that young kid. Mm. Um, I'm not sure whether you remember his name or if you're even in contact with. 
with him now, but I'm certain that that kid reflects back on his time to have a sounding board like you to be able to go, you know, even if it was something as small, uh, what insignificant to mm. yourself, where you, how do I clean this? How do I move this? That probably saved that kid a couple extras or saved that kid a bollocking at least. Yeah, hopefully he, he, he looks back on it and says, oh, that old bloke at OTS <laughs> helped me. I had one. I had one in my platoon. He was in my room, but over the other side of the petition, and I'm telling you, I still remember that guy yeah. crystal clear. Yeah. He did save my ass on yeah. plenty of occasions. Yeah. So, yeah, Luke, you're yeah, absolutely mm. right. Was there a, did you have an aha moment or a realisation going, I don't feel like a civvy anymore? Like, were you starting to embrace the military values and spirit and, like, fabric of it all? Yeah, absolutely. So I was – I went down there on the 11th of Jan. Um, it wasn't until April. So, thankful, or luckily, I was at OTS during Anzac Day. Um, and so at that point, they go down to the nearest RSL and we actually get to form up and march for real in front of the public. So good. Yeah. And that was the moment for me where I was like, well, I'm not a civvy anymore. I'm actually in the military and people are paying respect to that. So Recognising. Yeah, yeah, re- yeah, so I was at the RSL after playing two up and I had a bunch of civilians come up and buy me beers. And yeah. I was like, wow, this is, yeah, th- this is real now. So yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, everyone listening should, you know, reflect on that exact mm. moment that you just, you know, realise that you're not you're mm. not in that civilian dress anymore. You've got a uniform on and people view you differently. Yeah, mm. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, which is good. Um, was there anything that was really challenging at, at training? I was absolutely terrible at weapons handling. Right. <laughs> good thing I didn't do that's, just, that's just being <laughs> – all the ORs are like, that's every fucking officer. Yeah. <laughs> I had to put in many extra hours to pass that bloody weapons handling test. Um, but I wasn't a bad shooter. It was literally just the actual handling. What, what gave you troubles with it, mate? Was the barrel end or mate. was it the... <laughs> I don't know if I'm dyslexic when it comes to weapons handling. <laughs> I have no idea, but I couldn't grasp it. But yeah. once it was all good to go, firing down range actually did pretty well. Yeah, um, yeah right. So, yeah. N- not P- a huge PT deal. was good for you. Drill? Yeah, so drill, a, a bit unco, but I think standard for most people, you yeah. know, as they get yeah. used to it. Um, PT was fine for me. Yeah, that was a big thing for me to go in as as a physically fit person. Uh, and I got rewarded in, with that in the end and got the PT award at the, at the end good. of the course. So that was a bit of a, a um, confidence boost, I guess. Even though I was one of the oldest on course, it kind of solidified that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <what I'm> <laughs> Stop it. The old guy at the front. Yeah, yeah the old, the old me, bloke man. at the front. Come on, <laughs> you <laughs> young blokes. Holding his own. It's a couple That's of right. fucking extra miles in these legs and I still got you covered. <laughs> as, as I said, you know, the other week when I was, you know, sort of sitting down with our team doing my intro, that that being physically fit and physically prepared, mm. it not only not only takes that target off your back that's painted by the DS if you sort of stand out as a slacker or you haven't prepared yourself well, but it also makes it makes those challenges, you know, it can become very fatiguing going through, you know, because it's non-stop, right? It's non-stop mm. either physical or it's non-stop, you know, educational that you're going through and then putting that into practice. If you're physically fit and at a standard where you can meet those physical requirements, it really starts to uncouple that physical requirement from the learning. And so so in my experience, and I'm sure I want to grab your thoughts on it, did you mm. find that other things were easier because you were in a physically fit state? Yeah, couldn't agree more. So it's for me, it's a quick win. It's an easy yeah. win. Yeah. Going, going into to OTS or basic training, whatever it is, physically fit. So there were naturally people on the course that weren't yep. and they struggled. And you've got enough on your plate as it is. So if you can get that at the start, the rest is sort of... You can focus on the education, yeah. you can focus on the marching, you can focus on the fucking weapons handling, whatever it might be. Um, you do not want to be private pile with the jelly donut. Yeah, that's Get right, the yeah. fuck <laughs> off my <laughs> obstacle. <laughs> and you don't want to be going No, it's just it's one less thing on your plate. Yeah, like yeah, you said, right, like yeah. it's just one less thing you need to worry about. Yeah. It's like, oh, got all this other stuff you need to learn. I've got PT coming. I'm like, sweet, I'll just yeah. fucking cruise through yeah. that. PT I, was know, the I've break. Got my, the I've got my engine stuff. sorted out. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah which yeah. is good. Mm. What was it? Um, when did you first, when did you find out during the end of your training there that you were going to be, w- where you were going to get posted? And did you enter in as an Intello? Like, did you go in core ready? Yes. Or, so you know, Air speciality? Force recruit as, yeah. as specialities. Right. So I knew going in I was going to be an Intello. Um, so OTS was the 17 weeks, then you head off to, to Intello training. So after OTS, you don't know where you're going to be posted, but you know you've got training in Adelaide and Canungra up the road. Yeah, Different to Duntroon. Yeah, I was mm. literally about Go to ahead. say that, RT. Sorry. So I think Navy and Air Force, they're very specific on the way that they recruit. They recruit into, you know, into specialised roles, whereas, you know, for, for the green the green among us, you know, you'll know that, that – 
those for officers at least, you have no idea where you are going right up until the 11th minute, mm. 11th hour. So, you know, you're kind of at the at the finish line and they'll go, righto, mate, you're going to catering. And you go, <laughs> I don't want fucking catering. Yeah. Yep, too bad. Just you're going to cater. Yeah, you're yeah. going to cook shit. That, that, that is a reflection of your performance. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> All right, I'll cook shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Air Force do that a little bit now, I think, with the, the pilots and the air crew. So they, they don't necessarily know where they're going. They're calling it mission mission crew or something. So if you're going to be air traffic or some sort of pilot, you're all going in as one. And then okay. at the end of that training, you get diverged into yeah, your right. fast jet, your fixed wing, your grounded. You're flying a cargo plane full of rubber dog shit. Yeah. <laughs> your, <laughs> traffic, your traffic controller on the ground, whatever it is, yeah. I guess... You know, there's some certain benefits to that you can see, like, you know, if they give people that breadth of opportunity to mm. be able to perform. So some people might not back themselves necessarily when they're jumping through that gate and they mm. have to go through that change of career path at later in life in, in terms of inside the Air Force. But I guess if they give that pe- give people the breadth of opportunity to be able to prove themselves through that ab initio period, then, mm. you know, there's potentially a lot of good to come from that. Yeah, and I think that's why they, they put that procedure in place, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. You would have been stoked, no doubt, you got posted back to Newcastle. Yeah, so that was um, that was real a really really good outcome with with my and DPs. that was your preference, no doubt. Absolutely, mm. yeah. So during uh, my IETs, so I was in Adelaide straight after OTS. We found out that Amana was pregnant, so that was a big driver to obviously get back to Newcastle. She was in the middle of her posting cycles um, at uh, 41, um, 41 wing, so I needed to get back to Newcastle. Uh, essentially, out of IETs, I think I finished in October twenty. 19 and Mo was born the 1st of Feb um, 2020 mm. so I needed to get back to Newcastle to be there for the important class yeah because yeah. I missed I missed a lot of the the pregnancy um, so thankfully DP were on board you know. what a common story yeah <laughs> yeah it is for you <laughs> yeah mate how was how was Amana whilst you were going through the training like was she really supportive knowing that she'd been through something very similar herself or was she more more down the line of mate just suck it up and get it finished <laughs> I think I think for, to start with, yeah, 100% supportive. And I don't think I would have been able to do it at 33, 34 without a partner being in and understanding the full process. Of course, um, yeah. and, and, you know, going full full dark for, for a few days or a few weeks and you're not going to hear from me because I'm too busy doing stuff. Um, so very, very understanding. I think by the end of it, like IETs, she's like, get it done and come home. You know, heavily pregnant. Wants me back, all that stuff. Yeah. Working with the Intel community, of course, is a huge element of being in SOCOM. We get mm. access to different compartments and different briefings and whatever else, and clearly we're not going to talk about them now. But how was that as you got inculcated into that very special world of getting your briefs and your T and your PVs and then the different sort of special access programs and stuff? Did you did you find it super interesting? Yeah, that was that was the big driver for getting into the intelligence community for me was the the um, I guess the unknown of what could potentially be behind that black curtain. Mm. Um, but it was a long process. Everyone knows getting your PV takes takes some time. I think I had one of the one of the quicker ones. Fortunately, not too many skeletons in my closet. Mm. Um, but it still took. I and think. a very heavy sponsor as well. Yes, like this right, dude's yeah. a fucking Intello. Yeah. yeah, bump him to the front of the line. Yeah. yeah. So I, I finished IETs <laughs> without a PV, which means you can't necessarily go to where you, yep. you should. I was I was driving out of um, so I had left Canungra. I had to go back to Adelaide to graduate. Still didn't have my PV. Had my posting to Newcastle, but they were going to shove me in a in a non admin um, spot. Yeah, yeah, admin spot. And then as I was, I think I was in like Mildura or something heading back and I got a phone call to say, you, you're cleared, you're good to go. So yeah. for those listening that are not sure what a PV is, it's called a positive vet when you've got your top secret clearance. So you can be to, um, top secret negative vet or top secret positive vet. Yep. And they're just sort of more technical terms about the levels of it's information levels that you can be exposed to. You and, access, you know, it's yeah. almost the, the need to know principle. Absolutely. Just because you're a negative vet doesn't mean they're not trustworthy. You just don't need access to the deeper level stuff. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it just depends on usually where you're working. Yeah. And what, what you need it for. So mate, yeah. we've hit that point in your career now where the training wheels are off, mm. right? So you've yeah. gone through you've gone through your training, you've done, you know, those the difficult, challenging, the rewarding of going through training command. Um, you've got your PV. What next? <laughs> so I yeah, as I said, posted back to Newcastle. I had a a posting to eighty eight squadron, um, at but it actually got pulled at the last minute to and I got put into HQ. So the Intel um, squadron HQ is based in Newcastle. And I was put in the stando position to cover a, a mat leave spot. What's um, a stando, mate? So standards officer. Right. Um, so generally, within within the intel community, I think for, for most within the air force, it's a pretty highly regarded spot. Sure. Uh, it's a patch wearing position. 
and they they threw me in there as a as a brand new flying officer for six <laughs> months and said, "Don't let the house burn down." While, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's while, the keys. Don't yeah, burn it down. <laughs> exactly right. Um, so I learned a lot in that position. It was just um, you know drinking from a fire hose. Yeah. Essentially, it wasn't. It was back of house intel. So the HQ stuff, you don't necessarily need the PV. Um, so it was a lot of the systems and processes behind 87 Squadron, um, which was really beneficial for me going back into the tactical mm. posting where I was meant to go. And what aircraft are they flying? 87 Squadron? Mm. None. Right. No, no, no they had the, the HQ, <laughs> but like what, what squadrons were they supporting? So, yeah, so what were you – like? I'm just trying to paint the picture of the – what's the so what? What's the actual capability that you were managing? Sure. So – 87 Squadron is the Intel Squadron within the Air Force. It's set up a little bit differently to the to the Army, I think. We are basically seconded, for lack of a better term, to each flying squadron within the RAF. So we're 87 Squadron, but if you're posted to uh, 42 TIF, which is where I ended up, you sit under 2 Squadron, which is the um, wedge tail. Mm -hmm. So right. you're supporting that aircraft. There's Intellos that are posted to 81 TIF, which support the fighter guys, right? Correct. Got it. Yep. Um, so you're... You're 87 squadron, but you're kind of wearing two hats. Yeah. You've got two squadrons. You've got two mum and dads, essentially. You just become yeah. a capability brick that sort of goes out to provide that direct capability support. Exactly right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, I think it changed. So at one point in time, you were posted to the actual flying squadrons and there was no 87 squadron, but the issue they found was the training continuum got it. Yeah. just wasn't there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no tech con chain there. That's yeah. good. It's, yeah. That's the, that's the mm. capability. I saw like a AWACS platform yep. um, wedge yep. tail. So that was that was my bag, was, was the wedge tail. Yeah, yeah good. Mm. Did you get down into the squadrons eventually? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I did Tell the six about months that. Um, covering the stando <coughs> spot and then got released to essentially end up in, in 42 TIF supporting the wedge tail. And that was that was sort of the moment where I was like, wow, I'm actually doing Intel now. You're on um, the tools. Yeah. You're being so a technician. Being a technician, being a tactical Intello and briefing air crew before they, before they step and before they fly. How was that? Tell us about your first brief, mate. Were you nervous, or was it was it more the case? Like you know, I'm a, I know you as a fairly confident guy, and and also very competent, by the way. I just want to know when you went into that first brief, did you have those butterflies in your stomach, or was it more of a case of fuck, I've got this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, this is, I was, yeah. certainly butterflies in the stomach. But I say to people, I was an average Intello with an above average moustache. So <laughs> when I walked into a room, it upped my credibility a bit. <laughs> They Checks out, mate. They necessarily didn't care what I was saying. They were just looking <laughs> at my moustache, which helped me. Um, no, my first brief was actually to the One Star. Yep. Um, so it was a fairly high yep. weekly Intel brief. Um, but thankfully, she was very supportive of Intel. Um, so she was very accommodating. And it was moustaches. My first one. And moustaches, yeah. <laughs> um, very accommodating. It, it had been a, a brief that had imbe been embedded for a long time. Yep. Um, so it was a nice, soft, uh, I think, introduction I didn't have the, the air crew straight off the bat, which are the ones that can fire the, the long and curly questions at you. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things, mate, if you're flying uh, um, air ops, the Intel picture and the Intel brief should drive what the operations look like. Exactly. It's the same with SOCOM. Like in, yep. Intel drives operations there as well. Yep. You don't go and risk lives, um, material and other uh, other capabilities if the juice is not worth the squeeze per exactly. se. So the Intel, um, you know, people that we used to work for, was well, they were brought into the group mm -hmm. and go, right, I'm now relying on the credibility and the source data of what you guys are providing and the assessment. Because just, just so everyone that might not be aware, there's lots of different information feeds that come in. <clears throat> the real magic happens when the fusing of that information mm. and the assessment of that information, where you turn it from info into intelligence briefs. Exactly right. You don't yeah. receive intelligence briefs, you create intelligence briefs yeah. based on lots of different info. Yeah. So did you enjoy that part of it as well? Yeah, like and I that think that's fusing and analysis and the, and and the spitting out of the assessment. That's right, and I think that's where my um, skills from the town planning career came from. Um, I liked the strategic planning. I liked looking when I was doing the the council stuff, looking at all sorts of different um, sources of of um, demographics and all that type of stuff. Transfer that to the military context uh, and the intel context. All different sources of data. And then, as you said, couldn't have said it better, fusing it into a product to deliver to your customer, whether it's one star, crew, um, or, you know. Let's use that as a little segue because guess what? In the Axon world, research drives property selection. Mm. It's the same thing. Intel drives ops. Well, the <laughs> operations of you being successful in the property game is you obviously buy a property in that area, but the... The, um, the research and so the infrastructure and the data and all the reports and the population growth and the demographics exactly. all get fused into the Axon research briefs and the links to the interactive maps and the government websites. Yep. 
tell us about obviously you're sitting here now as an Axon property coach and you and Amana have bought and built and gone through the whole Axon mm-hmm. process. Let's use that as a bit of a bridge into who found Axon first out of both of you and how did that sort of materialise? Because I remember when I first met you on our first Zoom call, I'm like, what a fucking moustache you've got, mate. <laughs> so I remember that's exactly what I thought as well. And Go his intelligence it. is good too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I discovered Axon first. I think it was 2018. Um, so I think it was only a show of potentially you and a couple of others at that point. I don't think it was the no, yeah, big. Beast we that started it was in now. 2017. Yeah, there you so go. So we turned so. six next week. Yep. So yeah, it's, there's and a I few in, into a cricket seasons under the yeah. belt since then. I found some documents online. I was just searching property investing. Um, I actually don't remember how I stumbled onto Axon and the military thing. I might have just wrote military just because Amana was in at that point. Um, so what the website was then and wrote it off and thought these guys are, this is Charles and stuff. Yep. They're scammers. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not touching it. Fair enough. Um, sat on it for, I think the better part of 12 months and then it came around again. Because um, if you went to our website, our little smart pixel on the back end would have followed you to your social yes. media accounts yeah. and then you're like, <laughs> fuck, I've known, is that that same logo I saw before? Like, do you feel like that's how yeah, it probably absolutely. happened? Yeah. And it came around again, obviously a year later, things had developed and I was like, actually this, this is kind of hitting the right the right spot. Um, felt a bit more comfortable. Took I it to Amana, and uh, she was like, "Scammers, I'm not touching." <laughs> <laughs> like it's scammers. <laughs> Don't really. But I was just gonna say, did you did you have a, a background in investing before this? Did you have, or was it a spark that was there, and you were looking for like, you know, a lot of our clients, they'll they'll have that spark inside them, and they'll know what it is they want to achieve, you know. But it's about being humble enough to be able to put up your hand and say, "I need fucking help in navigating this problem set that is investing." Did you have that spark, or had you invested before, or was this sort of your first rodeo when you were really looking for help? So that the was the way? first rodeo. Being a town planner, I'd been involved in the property space a lot, not yeah. necessarily in investing, but new building buildings, new construction process all that yep. stuff um funnily enough back when i was 22 a guy tapped me on the shoulder at some event and said hey i'll do a session with you and we'll do some property investing um wrote it off as a scam at that point <laughs> so very yeah, everything's skeptical a scam, yeah, very scared maybe that's <laughs> that's why well, i was an intel maybe yeah. um but no so when we reached out to axon that was our first essentially our first rodeo first shot, yeah. but why we did it was because we knew we wanted to buy in newcastle yep and up until that point, we'd been going out to the home worlds and stuff and trying to get our own uh, land. Yep. And we were just getting like crickets. People yep. were saying, oh, it's all gone or you've got to go. <laughs> Hi, my name's Ryan Amana. Have you got any blocks of land available? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I think one 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 gen even kind of laughed at us when we said, what, what's what's out here? Um, now, now, tell us about your first experience after you, so you've re-engaged yep. with Axon. Yep. You've sat down and you've gone through your, you know, your connection call and, you know, you've gone through your initial coaching. Tell us about the experience that yourself and Amana had after that initial coaching. After the, well, the initial... The, the feeling about it, yeah. Yeah, after the initial coaching, we... So we did it, I think it was at night times, like 7 o'clock. We'd put Mo to bed because she was about 8 months mm-hmm. old, I think, at that point. Poured a glass of red and said, let's just see where this goes. Did the call and we were both absolutely blown away. Yeah. We couldn't believe, particularly, which which I've said a couple of times in the last, last couple of weeks, is the the timeline that we do for people. Yeah. The, the sync matrix. The sync matrix, right, is putting all that stuff on paper and going, wow, this is, this is what we're looking at for the next three, four, five, six, seven years, factoring in um, military stuff as well. It was just phenomenal. Yeah. And now as a coach, mate, like, you know, sitting in on doing some coaching sessions with RT and myself, do you see that same response in people? Is that... Yeah, I think I'm highly receptive to it. So I know when I've noticed that when we put that out on the screen and it's complete, people go, you can kind of see the penny drop. And yeah. People go, wow, this is this is going to happen. This is cool. Because whilst it's whilst it's about you know the the core and crux of what we do is about identifying those windows to be able to provide people the best and safest opportunity to bring a property to life for them. Most people don't sit down and plan out their life to that level of detail. No, we certainly hadn't. Yeah. No. And, you know, we had a young young kid and we were talking about having another one and we had two dogs and didn't know where we were going to be posted, all that stuff. We'd, we'd spoken about it, never put anything yep. down on paper. So. Yeah. Yep. I'm highly attuned to it as well, of course, because yeah. I see so many young families. Like every time <coughs> I see a young family on a, on a TV screen standing at the front with their, <laughs> their house that's half built or they – haven't been able to, you know, be successful in their in their particular endeavor. I feel very very sorry for them, of course. But my almost my competing priorities. I'm like, 
I bet they did that by themselves. Mm. I bet they didn't think they need coaching. I bet they didn't plan it out properly. I bet they mm. didn't apply some of the military planning principles that either one of them may have, and this is with a defence couple or not, may have been exposed to before. They just had a crack and thought, mm. how fucking hard is it? We'll just go find a block of land and build a house. Yeah. Everyone go, else does right. it. You can't go wrong with bricks and mortar, right? Until yeah, so you just, fucking do. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, mate, I'm stoked. Obviously, yeah. I was very much a part of that and then yeah. I'm now I'm getting the own three, 360 feedback on what, what it was like. Um I remember when the when the rubber, rubber really hit the road, I got in, in contact. So, the overall concept for you guys was to apply one of the co- one of the case studies that you saw. Exactly, you're in Newcastle. Yep. It's a rising market. All the infrastructure, town planning that you'd be part of already. I didn't have to convince you of that because yep. you were you were you were literally living it, right? But I said finding the block of land and finding the right builder and synchronising the Dohas and the HPAS and the first time owners grant and stamp duty concessions, that was the greatest value you were going to get from me. Mm-hmm. And I remember receiving a phone call from one of the builder guys and I was like, hey, we've just had a block that's come back to market. It's in this suburb. Do you guys have someone for it? And I'm like, fuck. I'm going to have to ring them and go, I need you to go and secure this block of <laughs> land today. Yep. I'm very well aware that like we'd only known each other for the better part of three or four weeks. You know, you had the coaching session. I knew that you guys were super sceptical. I'm like, I'm just going to have to fucking ring you and go, I know you're not going to like this. I'm not putting any pressure on you. This is not a tactic, but fucking drop everything. This is the, this is the land sales office. This is a point of contact. Go tell them you're working with this builder and go and get the block of land. So I am pretty. I had to make that phone call. Yeah, it was... Yeah. I, re- I was driving out to our builder to go and start designing our house. It's still it's not fucking finished, by the way. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Tammy. <laughs> um, and I was like, I've just got to make the call. So I was in the car with Tamara as we were driving out there. Do you yeah, remember was, that call coming I, through? I do, because we it wasn't it wasn't too long after we'd had the, the coaching session and it was safe and controlled. We'll do the process and risk brief, location brief, all that stuff. And then we got a phone call saying, we got a blog for you. Drop everything. Get Press. out there now. Press. And do it. And we're like, holy fuck, this wasn't what, what was supposed to happen. Where's our plan? Yeah. <laughs> we haven't done the process brief yeah. yet. I'm like, we're still going to catch up at all, yeah. but there's a there's a fleeting opportunity sliding yeah. doors moment. Yep. And to your credit, you're like, okay, you, that's what you want us to do. We'll go and do it. Tell it. I wasn't there for it. So t- no. just bring that to life for yeah, us. Yeah, look, we had some we had some big conversations very quickly after that phone call. Um, it was a little faster than we probably wanted, but we put our trust in Axon. We knew from what we'd experienced until that point, um, that everything was going to be okay. Yeah. And, and while you don't have to go into to facts and figures, mate, mm. like, what was the outcome of that and what position did that put you and Amana in? No, inside? we are going to go facts <laughs> and figures. <laughs> like, of course we are. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a phenomenal purchase, that one. So we moved in in 2020. Yep. Um, it was under 600 for, for the land and build. Um, and it full was... Full turnkey package. Full turnkey, the whole yep. lot. Yep. Couldn't, couldn't be happier. And then... Um, two, three years later, we left Newcastle and we, we sold it um, as a strategy to move up here. Uh, and it was sold for 825. Yeah. Yeah, wow. That's, which is brilliant. Like, you know, it's 250 grand in capital growth. Yep. You walked away with more than that, of course, by yeah. the time you sold it. But yep. bring to life that, so you were in, lo- in, in location. <laughs> we were here on the Gold Coast. We were building your house for you from afar. Yes. You were driving past it every now and then. But, if, you know, what was your experience like during the build? It was it was completely hands off to be honest. The only time we went out there was when Mo needed to sleep in the car, and it was like twice, right? Um, so when you say out there, when you yeah, so you so we were living in Newcastle. Mm-hmm. Um, the property was out towards Maitland. Maitland, yeah. yeah, yeah. East Maitland is sort of Chisholm was the suburb. That's a growth area, brand new house and land, exactly right. um, which is know, where we were trying to get into yeah. pre pre axon, and we were just not getting anywhere. Um, but the actual the build process, I was going away a lot. Um, being in 42 TIFF, it's a very busy squadron. Um, so the, the wedge tail goes away. There's lots of exercises and stuff. So I was away a lot. Um, we had a phenomenal experience with the level of care and support. Um, the, the build support team just basically took care of everything for us. We knew when we had to sign stuff. We knew when we had to hand it in. Um, it was a completely hands-off experience. And, and luckily for us, we got in before the 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 building um, industry kind of hit hit some bumps. Mm. Um, just we got in, um, so it was a very smooth process for us. But irrespective of that, the level of care, as I said, from from um, Axon, was funnily enough the the trigger for us to, to go. Hmm, this is a really good company. Yeah, you yeah. know, we're starting to think post military. Um, what are we going to do? And I think Amana actually said at that point. 
if I ever leave the military, I'm going to go work for Axon. I didn't know this. And yeah, like, that's so cool. w- w- your your plan continued to evolve before mm. you guys were going to get out. You'd already took an, put an expression of interest in on your first investment property. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so when we did the end of build coaching, I'm like, hey, you guys have now got a bunch of equity. Yeah, go you, again. You know, you've, you've still got your double income. You've, mm. you've obviously both still work in the Air Force. There's an opportunity. Let's get your numbers crunched by Deb. Let's go back and like do the full process again. Bang, you'd already put an EOI in. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, as things started to progress, I think you guys were like, hey, RT, we need to talk. Through some curlies. I'm like, hey, talk. What's what's going on? So just just sort of bring to life now how your life started to evolve and as you and Amana were, you know, evolving as a young family, Mm. another child on the way, et cetera. Just because those family dynamics as a young defence couple, there's going to be a lot of lessons learned and observations that we can also pass on in the the last five minutes of this podcast. Yeah, so it was, we threw a lot of curlies at you, yeah. So I think there's version 15 of our plan. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, as, as we kind of put the expression of interest on the next IP, our lives started to take a different path. We were having some big conversations about post-military, particularly for for Amana at that point. She'd served for 10 years. So she she was sort of looking at what next. Um, we were both on the same posting cycle, so we were pushing hard to at least hopefully end up in the same same location, which was at that point probably going to be Canberra. Um, I guess side note to that is I was becoming increasingly um, unhappy in, in my job. Um, I wasn't finding the fulfilment that I thought I would. Um, as an intello, it was a very short period of time that uh, that happened. Um, so we're having a lot of conversations around, you know, I had six years in the military that I needed to complete. Where did that line up with Amana's posting cycle? Where did we want to go after that? Um, Bambino number two came, which was just another whirlwind. Mm. Um, so, yeah, some things started to really change for us in in a short period Quite of quickly, time. Quite yeah. quickly, yeah. Yep. Mm. And how did you find that um, – just to be able to have a coach on call, you can just like, hey, need a snap call, you know, let's talk later this week, just to shoot the shit. And like that sync matrix that we created that you said you found so helpful in the very initial parts, in my opinion anyway, became even more valuable yeah. to you because there was so much future chaos about to occur. Yeah, that was that was critical for us. And we, yeah, you're dead right. We, I think we messaged you and said, Robbie, we need a sesh. <laughs> yeah. And it happened a lot. Robbie, we need a sesh. Things are changing because we were looking at what postings might come on. Um, whether we were going to be in or out, um, what that meant for IP1. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff there that we, as you said, ca- it was chaos. Yeah. I, I often I often reflect on, uh, on you know, yourself, Amana, and a couple of other clients that we got when I'm talking to new clients coming in, and I talk about, yeah, you know, like it's not just about getting this first property in your life, you know, we do this because we love mm. we love doing what we do. We do this because it's our sense of purpose and providing, you know, providing that support to the defence community. And so, you know, I always, you know, reflect on your your situation and a couple of others to pass that on to to new clients coming through. That it's not the case of get this one property, you know, through the door and then you know it's gone. That's it's absolutely not the case with us. Like we want to make sure that your life is is you know in a controlled and safe manner. We want to make sure that it's not just about having your investments. It's mm. it's about making sure that you are living your best life as well through yeah, the Yeah, RT had a few coaching hats on. He was yeah. definitely property coach, welfare coach. Padre. Yeah, career Padre. Advisor. Yeah. Career, yeah, that's right. Ma- marriage counsellor. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, I need some more of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> we just couldn't nail him down as babysitter, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, that is one skill I do not have. Um, Amana will tell her own story here, no doubt, when we yeah. get her on shortly about her own experience. And, you know, how did it make you feel when she got accepted into the role to come and join Axon? Because that was before you. Yeah, she actually started uh, end of last year. Yep. Um, and the change that I noticed in her from getting out of the military and joining Axon was unbelievable. Um, the the drive, the motivation, the, just the pure happiness that she came home um, at the end of every day going, I love that. I love to work here. Yeah, this is the best thing It's ever. certainly a race to the top with you two, mate. Like both <laughs> of you come in screaming and, and you know, doing great things. So it's, and let me just yeah. um, disclose to everyone here – a lot of people know that there was a lot of change in Axon last year and um, Tamara and I were just going to take things easy over the next couple of years and consolidate things. We went and did our own business coaching. Like As your coaches, we were able to provide options for you. We went and did away our own business. And they're like, when a business goes into a period of stagnation, it dims the light of the owner. Mm. So we came back from that session in late November and then did our retreat up in December mm. and we I did, a, I did a founder's address to everyone. I'm like, by the way, team, we're not going to sit stagnant. We're going to grow again. And what was, the, what was the response, Luke? Yeah, it was yeah. everyone standing ovation around the room. <laughs> yeah, it was like, yes, like, let's right, fucking do let's this. Fucking do this. <laughs> and then, of course, my my brain started ticking over straight away. I'm like, right, I need to now I need to find another property coach. 
And I think I might have been on the piss even on our on our <laughs> retreat. I'm like, hey, uh, Amano, what's Ryan doing? She goes, actually, he's not that happy. Like yeah. he's, you know, that fulfillment. She used that term as yep. what you just used as well. I was like, when we get back, let's have a serious conversation about maybe Ryan joining us next year. Mm. Fucking fast forward a couple of months. Bang, you're yeah. here as a property coach. <laughs> she, uh, magic, oh, yeah. magic. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, <laughs> that she is serendipitous. Yeah. Yes. I just banged the desk and the magic button came up. How about that? And she uh, mentioned, Ryan yeah, that's right. <laughs> She mentioned that story to me and it was on, I think you guys were on a boat and it was after a few beers and I just shrugged it off and thought, no, nah, Robbie's just talking out his elbow. Um but yeah, here I am. You Most are. people would say asshole, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I want to be a PG. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you've been here for uh, you've been here since the start of the year, effectively. Yeah. Um, the better part of a month under your belt. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? Loving it. Yeah, As I say, good friends stab you in the front, so go for it. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> you've got a you've got a, a, a captive audience, mate. <laughs> no, as I said to someone the other day, I've I've worked in a lot of places, as you can kind of gather from my story. I've never worked in a place like this. The the systems and processes that are processes that are in place um i love that stuff so i love that um but the the camaraderie within this team is sort of what i didn't get in the military mm. but i'm getting it in a civilian setting which i didn't think i could with a bunch Never. of busted veterans yeah that's yeah. right i'm not busted but no, sure. you're, the, you're the only you and amana are the only yeah. the unbusted ones. ones yes <laughs> and i never got that in the town planning concept yeah. context either um, yeah so it's a it's a phenomenal place to work can good I, answer mate you can stay <laughs> <laughs> i was just about to say you know as we sort of wrap up and, and head towards this man i just want to pass on my personal sentiments of having you working here with us as well like it is fucking fantastic there's no other turn of phrase for it mate it's it's so good to have somebody you know the ying to rt and my yang <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so good to have somebody on board that's just you know you're very clever you're very diligent you're very focused and and you know so, so for us that's exactly what we want in an individual because we know that out of that the client gets the best experience the best journey and the best service provided to them so it's fucking great to have you board mate i just can't wait for you to really really explore the one word which encompasses you and it starts with c and it's care <laughs> you're, a fucking, you're a very very good bloke mate welcome to axon thanks, thanks so much and that's your first little experience of axons unleashed ladies and gents plenty of lessons learned that came out of that one hope you enjoyed that podcast keep listening because we've got a bunch more brand new basic training ones coming your way lukey thanks mate see you all plenty soon. more when that came from as well see you all next time